Hello, welcome back to these notes from our class earlier. Um, oh, I knew I was never going to get through them, but still adjusting to how long things take in this online space. However, I also wanted to make sure that you had the full amount of information that you would normally have in a normal class. So I'm just going to make you a quick video lecture here to go through um, the last couple of uh, slides that we were not able to get to together. Um, for the sake of completion, I'm going to um, kind of restart my lecture. If you remember um, what I was able to say, and we covered it already in your class, you can kind of page ahead, um, zoom forward in this lecture to get to the information that you need. So again, this is about pre-contact Native Americans, um, Native American societies um, in North America before Europeans showed up, um, and um, please take notes. So um, the question that we kind of started with in, in class was, where do you think the first immigrants to North America came from? Um, thank you for adding uh, your responses to this slide. Um, and just to, to review, the first immigrants immigrants to um, North America actually are coming from Asia. Um, they are Siberian, they were Siberian hunters who we believe crossed um, this area that's called Beringia um, before the year 12,000 BCE um, and spread southward. So if you're keeping track, that's about 14,000 years ago. Um, so it takes them a long time to spread all the way through the North American continent. Um, the reason why this was possible um, I'll get to in a moment. Um, we also believe that um, other uh, groups um, of, of humans may have crossed by sea from Asia um, or from even from Southwest Europe um, before, uh, before the 1400s. Um, we have some good archaeological evidence of, of those explorations from other groups as well. Um, I think the important takeaway here is that by the time that Europeans arrive here, they're not discovering anything. There are a whole lot of people already living in North America. Um, uh, the reason why this is possible is that the, um, the Bering Sea, um, that this kind of land bridge, um, that connects Russia, um, the Siberian part of Russia to Alaska, present day Alaska in North America, um, was exposed. And then during, um, the ice age that, that ice was sort of, um, uh, the ice made it possible for people to walk across um, this little bridge of land. After that ice age ended and the waters kind of receded into that area, then those two areas became kind of cut off from each other. Um, all of this also has to do with the, the changes in the, the geology of the Earth itself over um, several million years, right? All of these continents used to be kind of, we believe, glommed closer together to each other, this formation called Pangaea, um, and then various earthquakes and other kind of large-scale um, catastrophic events um, from a geological perspective broke the continents apart. Um, but you can kind of see it's interesting, you can see we are actually much closer maybe to Africa um, initially, and that um, uh, the, the breaking apart of the continents actually brought um, Asia and North America closer in contact with each other. So um, this, oops, this is a map um, showing you um, some of the regions of Native American groups that we talk about today. Um, uh, you often hear people talk about um, the Northwest, um, the Southwest, um, the Great Plains tribal groups, um, the Southeast, and the Eastern Woodlands as kind of this huge area that encompasses not just um, the Midwest, but also the whole um, Northeastern seaboard as well. Um, some of the names of these Native American groups may be familiar to you. Some of them may not be, and, and that's okay. Um, I think it's also important that we acknowledge that um, even at Northtown, like where Northtown is situated in the city of Chicago, is also Native American land, right? It was land that was owned by um, Potawatomi, uh, Ojibwa or Chippewa, uh, Miami, and um, a Sioux group as well um, at various times in the past before it turned into Chicago um, and then Saganash and then Northtown Academy. The way that these various um, groups um, operated and the kind of structure of their societies um, often was very tied to where they lived, the actual physical geography of their environment. You can kind of see from this map that um, in the golden areas of this map, these are people whose society was a hunter, hunting and gathering society. So they are much more nomadic. Um, they might have territory that extends over hundreds of miles, or they might not necessarily think of themselves as having territorial lines at all. Um, whereas in these deep, uh, excuse me, light green areas, um, these are more farming peoples. Um, so people who are more sedentary, who are going to be growing crops um, for subsistence and for trade. Um, 
in some cases uh, over a very broad area as well, um, but maybe much more similar to the farming that we're kind of used to thinking of today. So um, just a couple thoughts about indigenous North American land. Um, the word indigenous and the word native are equivalents, right? Um, when we're, you hear them interchangeably when you're studying this, this period of US history. If you are indigenous to something, you are original to it. Um, and uh, historians now believe that um, in terms of the number of indigenous people in North America before the 1400s, um, which is a significant century because that's when Europeans arrive, right, at the end of that, that century, um, that there may have been 40 to 60 million people living in North America. To give you um, a point of comparison, there were about 78 million people living in London in the year 1400. Uh, I'm sorry, not in London, uh, in Europe um, as another um, uh, continent. Um, so they're not terribly, this is not an empty land, right? Which is sometimes I think one of the single stories that gets, gets told about um, colonization is that there wasn't anything there that people were coming into, um, that it was a new world because it was fresh. Um, and there were 60 million people potentially living um, all over North America. So there were a lot of people around. Um, these were diverse um, villages and complex societies. The idea of tribes that we think about today is actually a much later um, Western invention to help non-Native people think about Native American groups. Um, Native Americans um, at in the 1400s or before would not have thought of themselves as being part of a tribe. They would have thought of themselves as being part of a village or part of a kinship group that had various relationships with others in, in a particular area. Um, these societies were, were complex. Um, we'll get into some of these details um, in a little bit um, when we look at the Eastern Woodlands. Um, but these are societies where there are kind of clearly defined roles for men and women. Um, men and women both share in multiple parts of these societies. Um, they have religious practices that are not um, going to be the same as the Judeo-Christian practices that we see in, um, in um, Europe and in Africa developing during this time um, uh, that, that are monotheistic <clears throat> or even polytheistic. These are more of what are called animist beliefs that are very much imbued with the natural world. Um, these societies are often also matrilineal societies, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, so the, the, the development of these societies around the natural environment is significant. Um, we also see, um, again, like in any society, there's going to be conflict. Um, so there's peaceful and inter-tribal -tri conflict um, between these groups. Um, wars are fought for two reasons. Um, there were many wars during, during this period of time. Um, sometimes they were uh, territorial, right? Um, trying to make another village pay tribute, trying to take over um, or, or maybe get payment for land that was being taken away. Um, and we also see people who are gaining captives um, who are then adopted into their tribes um, or into their, their family and their kinship groups. Um, so let's get into these, um, these uh, regions a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, first region I want to talk about is the Southwest. Um, so if you think today about the American states of Arizona, Colorado, um, Mexico, um, I'm sorry, uh, Texas, New Mexico, um, you can kind of think um, about what is the climate like in the Southwest. Um, this picture may also give you a clue uh, that this is a, a pretty dry and arid part of North America. What's amazing about um, some of the Southwest indigenous groups is that they, they built um, incredibly complex irrigation systems in order to grow crops. Um, the major crop here is going to be maize um, or corn, uh, which um, if you know anything about growing corn, it doesn't grow well in a desert unless you have um, a lot of water that you can bring in um, throughout the growing season and all the way into the harvest to make sure that, um, that those crops grow well. Um, these are groups that are going to be using clay um, and timber uh, to build their dwellings. Um, the dwellings are going to be called pueblos um, later by um, Spanish missionaries who encounter them. Um, but they are sophisticated. Sometimes they are freestanding, like the one you see in this picture. Sometimes they are built into the cliff um, walls of um, uh, some of the settlements that you see in, in, the, north, in the southwest. The next group I want to talk about are the Great Plains. Um, these are, um, I think sometimes when we have kind of this um, single story about what Native American life looked like, um, this is often some of the images that pop into our head. So these are groups that are primarily going to be engaged in hunting and gathering, and this creates a lot of intertribal conflicts, right? If you're thinking about kind of 
who has access to the land, what are the boundaries of that land. Um, the primary thing that is being hunted here is the American bison, um, which you have a picture of down here at the bottom. Um, once Spanish horses are introduced um, in the early 1500s into this area, it is going to dramatically change the way that people are able to do hunting um, in the Great Plains. Um, but uh, before the introduction of bison, people were doing this on foot, which means that if you're tracking a huge herd of animals, you have to have a, a society that can literally pack up and move um, along with those animals. So this is a highly nomadic society. Um, the st dwelling structure of a teepee, right, um, where you have stretched skins around a base of um, a couple of tent poles that can be easily collapsed and packed up and moved to another site um, is something that is going to help uh, the people who lived in this region be able to sustain themselves and go after the, the animals that they were hunting. The next region I'd like to talk about is the Eastern Woodlands. Um, so this is this kind of large region that includes the Midwest and spreads all the way to the East Coast. Um, this is primarily a farming-based um, society or, or group of societies that are evolving in the eastern woodlands. The three really important crops that are being grown here are um, often referred to as the three sisters of the Native American diet, which are corn, squash, and beans. Um, I have been gardening a little bit this summer, and I can I have not grown any corn, but I will tell you, my zucchini and my summer squash is like... It has taken over my garden. Um, this is a very, very good part of the country to grow these particular crops. And um, they also support each other. It is easier to grow one, all three of these than to grow any one of them independently. Um, so these are crops that are grown for subsistence, which means being able to eat and feed yourself and your family, and also for trade. Um, one of the thing that, things that's really interesting about the Eastern Woodlands societies um, that we know is that um, power who had um, power or authority in these societies was often um, uh, a question of matrilineal or female descent, right? Matrilineal means coming from the mother. So um, when a couple was married, um, the husband joined the wife's clan or kinship group. Um, Iroquois women, women were chosen to be chiefs um, in these areas. Um, they were kind of the, the de decision makers for these societies. Um, for the Algonquin group, which is um, in kind of uh, northern New York, um, women could be chiefs. Um, uh, they could actually take on that role as opposed to just choosing the people who were going to represent them. Um, which also kind of brings me to another um, point on this slide, which is the idea of the Iroquois League. Um, the Iroquois League is a group of um, five tribes. Um, if I go back to my previous slide, I can actually show you uh, this little box up here. The Mohawk, Seneca, um, Onondaga, Oneida, and Cayuga um, groups were um, in a confederacy. They were basically in a political alliance that becomes known as the Iroquois League. Um, they're a, kind of an early blueprint for a representative democracy. Um, the founding fathers are going to be in part influenced by the political structure that was created by the Native Americans um, whose land that they moved on to. Um, these are uh, groups that are living in um, longhouses, more permanent structures made out of timber. You can kind of see an illustration here of what those may have looked like. Um, there's one particular site um, that's given um, archaeologists and historians a lot of information about this um, group, which is the city of Cahokia. Um, this was founded in about 70 AD, um, so again, um, thousands of years before Europeans are going to arrive um, in, in North America. Um, archaeological remains of it uh, are, are still around today. This is um, what's called the part of the Adena Hopewell um, uh, cultural group um, who were mound um, builders. Um, so you can kind of see, even if you were to go down to Cahokia today, which is sort of near um, St. Louis in southern Illinois, you can still see these earthen structures that remain um, from the city. Um, Cahokia, we, we believe, prospered because it was the hub of um, a trading network that spread all throughout the eastern woodlands. Um, we believe it had a population of uh, over 30,000 people um, at its height, which is more people than my hometown. Um, I believe it's more people maybe even than some of the major cities in Europe at this time. Um, and it was eventually abandoned. We don't exactly know why. We believe it was abandoned due to climate change in the area. That could have been a severe drought um, or severe rainstorms that made it impossible to grow some of these foods that would have been traded in the center and then the, the, the city kind of um, disappeared. 
that was a lot of information in just a couple of minutes. Um, I hope you guys are still with me. If you have been taking Cornell notes, so you have your left-hand column with kind of your, your regions and your right-hand column um, with more of the details, this is a really good time to sum up, um, kind of draw a box at the bottom of your page and summarize what you have learned about some of these pre-contact Native American societies in just a sentence or two. What are kind of the, the two major thoughts that you're going to take away from these notes? You can pause the video here to do that, um, or you can do it um, when you're finished watching. The last thing I would like you to do, and you can do this on Schoology in the form of a submission to this assignment, is just write a reflection. We're going to talk a little bit later this week about what makes a good reflection for a grade in this class. But for now, I just want you to take a stab at sort of answering this question. So write a reflection about North American societies before European contact, again, one or two sentences. Um, and a reflection is a little bit different from a summary. Um, so you want to describe your own thoughts and opinions. Think about when you were answering questions about the Nasarema um, earlier in class. So you could answer questions to get you started with, like, what do you, what do you think about this topic? Um, what are some conclusions or inferences that you can make based on what you've learned as a result of taking these notes? And then think about whether your thinking has changed. Is your viewpoint on Native American societies or people different now that you have maybe learned more about them? Um, good luck. I can't wait to hear uh, what you guys come up with, and we will see each other again soon. Thanks.